Welcome, friends, to the week of confusion. Why confusion? Because we've finally started to get indications that there could be a launch of Starship as soon as this weekend. But we also have regulatory agencies that are saying the exact opposite, and that a launch is not possible any time in October. So what the heck is going on? Howdy, Tank Watchers. I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Henson Shaving. Before we discuss the conflicting information floating around with regards to Flight 5's launch date, let's first set the table and take a look at all of the other hardware and construction that's going on at Starbase. First, let's check in with the parking garage. As we've noted in previous videos, it's already in use, but it's not quite fully complete yet. SpaceX looks to be adding a staircase on one side, and is continuing to cover the side of the structure with some sort of paneling. This could be some type of insulation, or maybe just a decorative thing, or maybe it's just glass windows to create an air gap and prevent the inside of the building from becoming too much of an oven. Either way, you can see cars already parked on multiple floors of the building, so at least it's already getting some use, despite being unfinished. Over at the office building, work on the connection between it and the Star Factory continues to progress, with the corner of the structure finally getting sealed off. The rest of the office building appears to be coming along nicely at this point. It even seems like SpaceX has begun outfitting the interior of the building, which is pretty neat. Over at the production site proper, specifically in the high bay, work on retrofitting Ship 31's heat shield is continuing. Ship 31 is being prepared for Starship Flight 6, so it's next in line to launch right after Flight 5. That's how numbers work. Given all the testing already done on the Flight 6 vehicles, it wouldn't be very surprising to see a short gap between Flights 5 and 6. So hopefully, once this regulatory fun time is behind us, we'll finally start to see the launch cadence ramp up here in Starbase. Crews appear to be giving extra attention to the heat shield area around the flaps of Ship 31, which we know from Flight 4 is an especially important and challenging area to shield from re-entry heating. We'll get to talking about the Flight 5 stack in a little bit, but one piece of hardware sort of related to it, the transport stand that was used for Booster 12, was removed from the launch site and moved to the Sanchez lot, presumably so it can be used to transport other boosters, or maybe just to free up space at the launch site. Next up, the booster thrust simulator, which is used to validate and test the structural integrity of a booster's aft section, was moved back to the ring yard in front of the Star Factory. This move, we would come to find out, was done in order to pick up Booster 14, which was getting prepared for testing at the Massey Outpost. The thrust simulator was then moved into Mega Bay 1, and Booster 14 was lifted on top of it. The combined booster and thrust simulator stand then left the Mega Bay and was parked in the ring yard until it was time to roll to Massey's. But before that roll could happen, workers first had to prepare the booster for transportation. We saw some work being done on the booster QD area, which is important because a booster or ship needs to be transported in a pressurized state. While these transports can start to seem trivial, especially after having seen so many of them, it's still important to note that it's a move of a 70 meter tall and 9 meter wide vehicle down an extremely dilapidated public road. These things are never trivial. Late at night, which is seemingly when most moves occur these days in Starbase, Booster 12 was rolled to Massey's in preparation for proof testing. While the late night rolls kind of stink for photography purposes, they are better in terms of being less of a disruption to the flow of traffic and access to the beach. Over at Massey's, Test Tank 16, which is being used to verify the design of the aft section of version 2 Starship, was released from its shackles, which could mean that SpaceX has gleaned all the precious data they could and thus have wrapped up this phase of testing. Just in time, too, for Booster 14 to arrive and begin its own testing campaign. While we're on the subject of interesting things happening at the Massey Outpost, this week we got a crazy treat in the form of close-up views of the salvaged aft dome from Booster 11 that was recovered from the Gulf of Mexico. It seems like this is the end of the salvage mission for Flight 4 hardware, as the ship used for the operation, HOS Ridgewind, left the port of Brownsville and headed back to Louisiana, rather than going back out to where Booster 11 splashed down. Seeing this hulk of twisted metal up close and personal, and knowing that it had been through a launch, a landing, an explosion, oh my god, it was a major highlight of the week. It's not every day that you get a close shave from a gigantic piece of flown rocket debris. And speaking of getting a close shave, here's a quick word about today's sponsor, Henson Shaving. I shave my head and my neck about every other day. It makes me feel good, and it keeps me from getting all scruffy looking. A few weeks back, I went to a friend's wedding out of state, and of course, I wanted to look my very best. Unfortunately, when I got there, I realized I had forgotten my AL-13 razor. 
I already knew I preferred using it, but spending those four days using an inferior multi-bladed thing really drove home to me just how much I prefer it. When Henson's AL13 razor showed up in my mail, I'll admit it, I was a little bit intimidated, but after using it for a few shaves and getting the hang of it, I just can't go back. Henson is all about precision. In fact, their razors are made in an aerospace machine shop. That means the blade can stick out just 13 ten thousandths of an inch. That's 0.0013 of an inch. It even looks like spaceflight or aerospace hardware. I mean, who doesn't love a finely machined part? I also like that there is no plastic waste. I can recycle my blades and feel good about not just throwing more crud into a landfill. Plus, each blade costs like 10 cents, which as I'm sure anybody out there who's recently bought some multi-blade disposable abomination knows, is a crazy good deal. So if you want to join me in getting an excellent shave, go to hensonshaving.com slash spaceflight or click the link in the description and use code spaceflight at checkout. You'll get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. That's like three years worth of shaves. Thanks again to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video and for making a cool product. All right, now let's talk about Tower 2 and the orbital launch mount for Pad B. Over at the second tower, the nets that are used to catch any potential falling objects during construction were removed from the lower portions of the tower. Removing these could be an indication that they're wrapping up work on that part of the structure, which is great because the sooner we get an operational pad B, the sooner we'll get to see two full stacks on two pads here in Starbase. This week, we also caught the arrival of more hardware for pad B's launch mount. All of this hardware is being staged at the Sanchez lot ahead of being assembled. One of the more interesting pieces that showed up, on Sunday actually, had a label indicating that it was for the launch mount's deck. Given how it's constructed, it looks like the deck could be water-cooled, which one would think would help with pad turnaround times, but we'll just have to wait and see. Here, we can see one of the suspected OLM parts being lifted. It'll be interesting to see what the exact assembly will be, as we're all kind of anticipating that SpaceX will go for a radically different design as compared to Pad A's mount. To complete the check-in on hardware for Pad B, we also saw some scaffolding erected around the chopsticks carriage system for Tower 2. It makes sense that crews are working on this part now, as it'll soon need to be attached to the tower, and it's easier to do any necessary modifications or preparatory work on the ground. Meanwhile, at Pad B, excavation of the flame trench area continued all week, as evidenced by the constant parade of dump trucks coming and going to haul out dirt. Okay, now we get to talk about the fun stuff. That's right, the Flight 5 vehicles and the regulatory mess that everything is currently mired in. We began the week with the full stack still on the pad in all its glory. Alas, it didn't stay that way for long. On Monday, September 30th, the ship QD was retracted, indicating that SpaceX could be preparing to destack the vehicles. After that, SpaceX workers inspected the area and also removed some lines that are used to attach the QD. For this, the work platform on the ship QD arm was extended. Meanwhile, more signs of a D-stack were present. The load spreader, for example, was moved to the launch site, which pretty much confirmed that SpaceX was going for a full D-stack of all components, both ship and hot staging ring. And then finally, the ship QD moved out of the way to make room for the chopsticks to move up and down the tower. You know the drill at this point. The vehicle was removed from the hot staging ring and lifted by the chopsticks down onto a stand. And you may be asking why SpaceX bothered to destack, and the likely answer is so they could get more work done on both ship and booster. This view has no particular news or updates associated with it, but it's always cool to take a peek at the Raptors on a ship. In this case, this is ship 30 during D-Stack, and we got to see its three sea level and three vacuum Raptor engines. After the D-Stack, ship 30 was moved out of the chopsticks and placed next to the orbital launch mount. It seems like SpaceX had no intention to move it back to the production site, which usually means the work that needs to be done is minor rather than major. Once Ship 30 was out of the way, it was then the hot stage ring's turn to be de-stacked from the booster. And this happened at dusk with just a few minutes of daylight remaining. Speaking of Ship 30, a lift was observed at the payload bay hatch with workers doing something inside of that area of the ship. But not only the payload section got some attention, the thermal protection system of Ship 30, which of course is a very crucial part of the mission, got some love as well, with some inspections around the flap area. Meanwhile, the CC-8800 crane was also lowered, which could be in preparation for an upcoming launch attempt. Of course, there remains a lot of uncertainty about this upcoming launch attempt and when exactly it'll happen. but. We'll go over the details here in a bit. The chopsticks also got a workout this week with SpaceX crews continuing to work on the landing rails. 
After the work on the landing rails was completed, the chopsticks did a few small moves. Another crucial piece of Flight 5 hardware that we saw tested this week were the pins on top of Booster 12, which we saw deployed. These small pins are used to push the heavy hot stage ring away from the booster during its backflip. The rotation of the two vehicles and different centers of mass then takes care of the rest. Next up, Ship 30 got its flaps moving as well, with the forward flaps of the ship closed while it was standing next to the tower. Around this time, Mary spotted a few of these ballast bags arriving in Starbase. In case you don't remember, these were used the last time SpaceX wanted to load test the chopsticks, and with the first catch attempt hopefully coming up soon, and all of the modifications the chopsticks have seen, it makes sense to do some more load tests with them. Their orange color makes them pretty easy to spot, so as soon as we saw SpaceX preparing to use the bags with the chopsticks, we all got a little bit excited. And there were a lot of these ballast bags in use. After counting, it seems like there was enough of these ballast bags to simulate up to 700 tons of weight on the chopsticks. This could be to simulate all of the force that a booster will exert on the tower during a catch. It will not only feature some propellant that is left, but it'll also have some velocity, which means the loads will be even more than just the dead weight of the vehicle. The testing was conducted after the bags were attached to the chopsticks, and to simulate the weight of the booster, they're filled with water. The crazy thing is, you can visually see the sticks bending over time as they're enduring up to 700 tons of weight. Remember, we expect current boosters to be more in the range of 200 to 300 tons, so this is probably the highest amount of force that these sticks have ever had to endure, and from what we can tell, the test went pretty well. And then, late on the evening on Saturday, we saw the return of the stack. Of course, over the previous day, the hot staging ring had been reinstalled, and then the ship was lifted on top of the booster. With spotlights shining, we got a wonderful view of the next launch's full stack. It's time for some regulatory fun time. I'm sorry, it's regulatory fun time. So the question is, is SpaceX going to launch Starship as soon as October 13th? This could very well be the last Starbase update before Starship launches for a fifth time. Well, let's go over all the facts that we have and try to fully understand what the situation is and why it's so confusing. Spoiler. It's not going to be a very satisfying answer here, and soon you'll understand why. Let's start with the signs for a launch. NOTAMs and not Mars are scheduled for a launch as early as October 13th. Yes, as early as Sunday, October 13th. The interesting thing here is that the not Mars are also looking like SpaceX has a significantly bigger landing zone around the tower, so it seems like they're intending this to be a landing profile. Once again, confirming that they're trying to go for a catch on Flight 5. Looking at the NOTAM, there is no mistake what this is for. Quote, dangerous area for launch of a rocket SpaceX Starship FLT-5. Besides that, we do not yet have road closures for launch. Yet. We do, however, have road closures Monday to Wednesday of this week, which are most likely for additional propellant load testing with the full stack. The road closure on Monday is scheduled for 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., which is a little bit different than usual, while the alternate closures on Tuesday and Wednesday are in the normal 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. slot. In terms of what kind of testing is going to be done during these closures, well, as of recording in this video, there's been no evacuation scheduled for Boca Chica Village, so some kind of propellant load test, but likely not a full wet dress rehearsal. But we'll just have to wait and see. Evacuation notices can always come out of the blue. So we have regulatory filings indicating that SpaceX might go for a launch as soon as October 13th, but what is creating this confusion? It seems like there's quite a bit of disagreement between the FAA and SpaceX, which to all of you out there in viewer land is probably not a surprise. We actually reached out to the FAA and asked if these not Mars mean that SpaceX has a realistic chance to launch this weekend, and the FAA responded and said that their statement from a few weeks ago is still accurate. This statement reads as follows. SpaceX must meet all safety, environmental, and other licensing requirements prior to FAA launch authorization. A final license determination for Starship Flight 5 is not expected before late November 2024. So we have these bits of conflicting information. We have the regulatory filings, but we also have the FAA saying, no way, Jose, not before the end of November. So what the heck is going on? Well, it could be a few things. The first thing it could be is that SpaceX expects something to change. Maybe the FAA statement is very much relying on the wording that is the current statement and things could change any day. In this case, SpaceX could have been informed already that the launch date could move to the left as early as this weekend. That's the most charitable answer, as it would probably mean that there's not really any tension between the parties. Option two is that NASA could have stepped in as a licensed partner. 
as we've established in our recent DOS Explainer video, which you should really check out if you haven't already. In theory, NASA can license launchers if they decide to be a partner for a launch. And this could bypass the FAA as a licensing partner. In theory, the DOD can do the same, but that seems rather unlikely in this case. NASA, however, is deeply involved with the Starship program, thanks to the Artemis program. So they could be stepping in, and maybe that's why we're seeing these launch dates so far to the left from what we expect and what the FAA is saying. The third option, and we really hope this isn't anywhere close to reality, but the third option is that SpaceX is actually looking to see how far they can push the envelope without getting into trouble, and are conducting these pre-launch steps without a license. This could result in significant legal disagreements between SpaceX and the FAA, so let's hope that's not what's going on here. We've asked the FAA why they went ahead with scheduling NOTAMs for a flight they are not expected to license, but as of the recording of this video, there was no response available. Once we get it, make sure to follow our socials so you can get updated there. Of course, for a flight, the flight termination system would also need to be installed and then armed to satisfy the safety requirements for a launch. So either way, expect the vehicles to be destacked and restacked at least once more ahead of flight. So what's the deal? Could Starship really launch as soon as this weekend? It's honestly really hard to predict. There's not a lot of info coming from SpaceX in terms of launch readiness other than the tweets saying, we're ready to launch. And neither the FAA nor NASA has said anything about a license approval change. So really everything's on the table between now and the end of November. Rest assured, we'll be tracking all of this very closely. So stay tuned because as soon as we get any updates, we'll be sure to share them with you. From my perspective, a flight this weekend is in theory possible, but elephants could fly out of my nose. That's also in theory possible. I, I don't know that either is very likely, but we need to take it seriously because if it does end up launching this weekend, we gotta be ready for it. But it could also just be that SpaceX is taking precautionary measures just in case things do move to the left. And in all likelihood, we're still getting a launch in late November. It's just so hard to say at this point. Be our guest to speculate along with us in the comments below. Thanks again to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video. Please help our channel out and yourself get a better shave and click the link in the description or go to hensonshaving.com slash spaceflight and use code spaceflight at checkout. You'll get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.